Hi, I'm Mark Pierce, Intelligent Triathlon Training. Today we are here at Loughborough University again doing some lab testing with, uh, with Sam. But first a little bit of background. So as this is my first vlog in a very long time, I've got to set the scene a little bit. So uh, I'm a triathlon coach. Uh, I was physiologist for British Triathlon for 10 years uh, before moving into coaching. So I worked through Athens and Beijing Olympics as a sports scientist and performance scientist. Then moved into coaching and coached um, Lucy Hall, now Buckingham, at London 2012 Olympics uh, before moving into what I'm doing now, which is working uh, on intelligent triathlon training and doing more long distance and Ironman coaching, as well as still coaching a few ITU athletes as well. And we coach a mixture of pros and age groupers. But anyway, that's enough about me. Let's see what we're going to be doing today. So we are heading into the performance centre here, wherever it's gone, there it is, there's the front door. Uh, and we've got Sam. Hello. <laughs> we are heading in for a um, run lab test. So we'll go through that in a little bit more detail when we get in there. So here we go, Sam's gotten cracking. So we're on the second stage of the test now. So we're looking at six minute stages on this, starting from 11K an hour, going up by 0.8 of a K an hour each stage. Uh, at the end of each stage he stops briefly, has a blood sample taken from his ear um, which we measure blood lactate levels. What we should see in the early stages is a nice flat line so blood lactate levels aren't going to change significantly. Uh, he's also got the mask on which is collecting his expired air so we're looking at oxygen carbon dioxide levels and from that we can calculate things like fat oxidisation and carbohydrate oxidisation rates at any particular intensity which we can evaluate afterwards, make some decisions that will help us to inform what type of training you might do uh, might need to do in terms of to maximise his performance in his Ironman or his 70.3 racing. We're also looking at things like running economy. Uh, so Sam's, uh, I've been coaching Sam for a long time, but we've never actually been in the lab. Uh, we've never had the opportunity to be able to do it. Um, and so we don't really know precisely what things like running economy look like. Now we've used a stride a lot, so we'll be getting stride data for, from a power meter, which also does incorporate things like uh, running efficiency metrics. And so we do get running economy from that, uh, but uh, I'd also like to know what it actually is under the lab conditions. And we can correlate that then with whether we might need to do more explosive weight training or resistance training, as it's the most effective uh, way of improving things like running economy. We'll then do, once he's finished this, this will take about an hour to do, he'll have about 20 minute recovery, and then he will do his max test, which is a, a fast ramp, sort of 10 to 15 minutes basically take him through till he literally falls off the treadmill. That's really part and part of it, because if we only have the submax data, it only gives a part of the picture. Now, you've probably heard some of the stuff about Blumenfeld's 100 mils per kilo VO2 max. That's all well and good. But if you're only, if Blumenfeld's a great athlete, don't get me wrong, but if he's only competing with guys who have got 80 mils per kilo VO2 max, his running efficiency or his cycling efficiency must be horrific. Um, so in my mind, shouting about having a huge, great VO2 max is nothing great shakes because you're clearly missing something somewhere else. The only other types of athletes I've tested and seen done like that generally have, uh, with huge VO2 maxes, generally have relatively poor running economies for instance. Now, VO2 max is not going to be the limiting factor here, it's how efficient they are and so that gives us a really good insight then into what we would do with the training side of things. Now in Sam's case I suspect running economy is not going to be too bad uh, but actually what we want to try and do <coughs> excuse me, is lift that capacity a lot more. Now does this apply, is, it, is this only for pros? No, not really. We've, uh, if you've watched any of our Instagram stuff, we've had quite a few of our amateur age group athletes coming through doing lab testing recently, uh, because it's equally valid for them. Uh, so all the information that we can get from this can help direct the program. The athletes we coach don't all have a sort of standard template of what they do, and you know, this time of year we do this, and this time of year we do that. It's all based upon what their individual responses are and individual characteristics are. We've got some athletes who are uh, very aerobic, uh, do a lot of volume, um, and we've got athletes who are maybe in the same sort of level of performance, but that type of training isn't where their weaknesses are or where, where the, the sort of area that suits them. So they're doing more quality, more high intensity, more polarized training, if you like, um, but not all year round. So those training methodologies, we want to come back in and retest this uh, again in a few months time, we might see that we've uh, made some changes to something, we've adapted this or we've adapted that. Now the bit that was a weakness is not such a, so much of a weakness anymore and we need to change the training stimulus and that might mean we go from a polarised model to a pyramidal model. 
or vice versa even, or a high volume low intensity model. It just depends upon what the results show and what the athlete's characteristics are at that particular moment in time and how we go forward with it. So in a couple of weeks time we've got a few more athletes coming in, um, so some who've not been in before, some who have been in before, so it'll be interesting to see the, the differences for them. Uh, and uh, we will be able to give you a bit more insight into what we're doing then. Obviously if Sam is one of our coached athletes and coaches, then what we're going to do after this video, so another video, we're going to actually go through the results, we'll show you what the data looks like and we'll talk a little bit about how we're going to use that information in his training. So if you're interested, follow along. You're supposed to say things like press the like button or the follow button or whatever it is. I don't know where they are. Um, I'm still getting used to this game. So do that if you want to find out what's happening next. So we've now gone, we're now on 15.9 Ks per hour or 239 marathon pace. The last stage was about 248 marathon pace, which was ever slightly slower than he did in Hamburg in the Ironman last year. And what we've seen sort of in that uh, previous stage is lactate levels are now starting to just creep up from baseline. So he's been pretty much around one plus or minus a, a very small amount all the way through. And the last one crept up to 1.2. What we should see now on this next stage is that red and blue line over here starting to creep a little bit closer to each other than they have done. So as you can see from the previous stages, they're all pretty much the sort of same distance apart as everything is pretty much all under control. Now, as the control starts to go a little bit, then we'll see those two lines close up. And what we'd see from over here is with the lactate analyzers, then what we will see from the data from that will be a slightly higher increase. Still under control, still sustainable, but it is gonna to start to get to escalate rather rapidly now, I suspect. Now, some athletes might have quite a big gap between first and second threshold, other athletes don't. My gut feeling is that Sam will be a little bit closer, one of those athletes with a less gap between first and second threshold. He's very well developed aerobically, uh, but because of the, the pre well, his profile, his preference for racing, he, his second threshold is not as high as other athletes might be, and, uh, and therefore, whereas his first threshold is, therefore that gap between the two is a little bit less. Okay, so we're now at 17 and a half k's an hour, and we went through first threshold around 15. We'll look at the data properly later to, to get a bit of a, a better uh, feedback on it. As we can see on here now, see that red line starting to creep up much closer to the blue line, and we can see the RER, respiratory exchange ratio, is starting to increase. It's gone up from sort of in the uh, 0.8s, now we're into the 0.9s. We're getting quite close to the end of this stage, so very shortly they're gonna be taking the blood lactate sample and we'll see where we're at from that but um, I suspect we are we're not at threshold second threshold but we're getting much closer now so we've probably maybe got one possibly two more stages to go so we've just finished uh, 18 and a half k's an hour so Sam's thinking yeah that's probably it that's around the threshold we're going to wait and see we're going to do process the blood lactate sample then we're going to make him start the next one but we're not going to go up in 0.8 because we're pretty confident that threshold is going to be very very close to where we are 0.8 would just not be probably achievable or beneficial. So we're going to go up 0 0.8, uh, 0.4 for the uh, of a kilometer per hour for this final stage, and we'll start him off on it. But if the data comes back from the lactates, uh, then that suggests that yes, we're clearly over that second threshold. Then we'll stop stop him. If if it's a bit dubious, if we'd like to see the end, and if he can make it through to the end of that that stage, then we'll go for that full stage and then give him a bit of a rest before he starts his max test. I'm probably not going to be too popular with that uh, last statement, to be fair. So uh, <laughs> he was expecting to get to this stage, I think. So sometimes you just got to push a little bit more. If the data looks good, if the testing looks good, fitness looks good, recovery's come well from his camp, maybe he's in a little bit better shape than he thought he was. But threshold isn't an easy pace, but it's not a super hard pace either. Turns out Sam was right all along. Athletes know. So we did, we did the lactate, came back, it's clearly broken, it's clearly gone through the roof, um, and we are now over second threshold on that space, so we don't need to continue the test on to try and kill him. So we want to save a little bit for the max test, and we know we've got the information that we're going to need uh, from the sub-max test now, so we can have a bit of a breather, uh, a little bit of a refuel, and get ready for hell. So we've now started the max test, and uh, running at a constant speed, so it's going to sit at 16k an hour, and the gradient is going to increase every minute by 1% uh, until he falls off the back. Well, maybe not 
falls off the back, but uh, has to move his hands down and stop because he can't keep up with it. So we're clearly only looking for one thing from this, which is the maximum aerobic capacity he's got, so VO2 max. So we can then set where the ceiling to performance is, and then from the submax test, we've got the bits, the layers that fill in beneath that. What we can see from the submax test so far is that actually first threshold is pretty robust and well developed. Second threshold, if you wanted to race middle, at middle distance or standard distance even, would not be sufficient to, to race super quick. Whereas uh, the first threshold, he's, he's not far off his Hamburg shape from last year where he ran 240, low 240s, I think, or 245 for, a, for the marathon. Um, so we're probably not in dissimilar shape to that. Um, but if you've only got the ceiling, if you only look at VO2 max, isn't going to tell you a great deal. You only look at thresholds. It gives you a bit more information, but it still only tells you a bit of the story. You don't get the whole picture, and you can't use the information to, to make good decisions about your training and or what types of training you're going to need to do in the future to, to maximise your performance. So in theory, we can look at the data we get from this. We can look at things like the running economy. We can look at the data we use from his stride to see how um, robust he is over long durations because uh, and we can use this to calculate what sort of time we can expect him to run. Now if we just look at where the threshold is it doesn't tell you what the the robustness is, the fatigue resistance if you like. So in theory he might be able to run X for whatever distance but we need to know and the lab won't tell us this uh, because we don't test to, to exhaustion. Um, we, can, we need that robustness from the training data, we need the sort of um, the, the, the factors that we have for that to be able to calculate how much drop-off there is likely to be from the straight performance to a Ironman performance, for instance, or from a 5K performance to a, to a marathon performance. All of these sorts of things mean that when we go to race, and then we try not to get too many surprises. We know what performance, we know what power you can hold, um, and we're the best will in the world. Long distance and middle distance racing, is a, it's not about going with the race. I don't subscribe to this theory, you've got to be in it to win it. If you go out at paces that, or powers that you cannot sustain, funnily enough, you're going to die. So for me, as coach, understanding what athletes are capable of, we go to races knowing that this should be possible. Now it can go wrong um, and it can be compromised by a bunch of other things, you know, weather, the conditions, the nutrition strategy goes pear-shaped or um, you, know, you lose bottles, you lose your nutrition or for some reason it doesn't settle on you very well. But we shouldn't suddenly find out, oh wow, so-and-so's gone 10 minutes faster than they've ever gone before because it can't happen uh, because we know the, the data and the training and we know the performances that they're capable of. Uh, that for me gives a lot of the athletes confidence that what they're doing is achievable so they can go to a race with a plan knowing that that is possible. They might have to adapt, they might have to be a bit flexible during it, but it is possible. Go on, we're nearly there. There we go. Boom. About nine minutes, I think he lasted. Good job. There we go. That is the run testing from the lab done. So. He's now, he's now off for a little swim, and we'll be back on Wednesday, it's now Monday, uh, back on Wednesday for his bike test, which follows a pretty similar routine. Uh, so the test protocols are not dramatically different. We're gonna do a couple of little uh, extra things around it, but um, we'll have a look at that on Wednesday.